So, um, the first speaker of our last session for the day is Martin James, please. Thank you for the introduction. So, today I'm going to tell you how the dynamics of small swimmers immersed in a turbulent flow, how it affects their auto transport downstream. The title provides a partial summary of our results. And this is joint work with Francesco Viola from GSSI, and this work was led by Anissa Seminera from the University of Genova. So let me start with um, the topic of auto transport in general, why it's a challenging and important question. You already heard Francesco's talk, and often organisms use or navigate auto landscapes to find food sources, to find mates or preys. And what you're seeing here is a simulation of the order field generated by a point source located here. And you can see, uh, advocated by a turbulent flow. And you can see that the order gets, when it tran gets transported downstream, it becomes sparse and it becomes intermittent, which makes it challenging for an organism which tracks this field to reach the source. And Francesco already explained one algorithm uh, which might be used by some organisms for this particular purpose. Now, often the source of this order field, uh, located here, for instance, in the simulation, it often is moving. If it's a prey or a mate, it moves, which introduces hydrodynamic fluctuations, which can affect the transport of the order field downstream. And this, uh, this, the hydrodynamic interactions caused by the swimming organism, the order source, it could potentially change the distribution of the order field downstream uh, could, uh, could lead to shielding of the order with some survival and uh, evolutionary advantages. And this forms the motivation or the background for our work. And what we are looking at are organisms which, if you think about this order transport and the effect of the hydrodynamic fluctuations, large organisms can, I mean, this somewhat evident that large organisms can influence the flow and that could have significant effect on its, uh, the transport downstream. And it's not really clear what would be the effect for small organisms. And this precisely forms the, the question that we are asking. So we are looking at organisms which are smaller than the sm smallest scales in the fluid flow, organisms such as copepods and zooplankton. And these organisms, they are found in large numbers. And the question is whether they, they can often be approximated by simple swimming modes, as, as I'll tell in a few slides. And the question is whether this collective action together with the swimming mode, can it potentially have an effect, the swimming dynamics, can it potentially have an effect on how the order is transported downstream? And if it does, whether different swimming modes offer different survival advantage from predators. So this is our uh, setup. It's a numerical study. The results that I showed today are entirely numerical with some analytical works uh, being done underway. So this is the numerical setup. What you're seeing is a simulation box. Uh, and the particles, they, uh, the swimmers, they are located in a cuboidal box over there, as you can see. And the flow is along this direction. And uh, it's an open channel flow, which means there's uh, it's no slip on the bottom surface and uh, it's free slip on the top surface. And the flow is generated by DNS and the order is simulated by advection diffusion equation. Now, how do we take into account the, the fluctuations introduced by the swimmers? To do this, uh, the f first thing uh, to consider is these swimmers are smaller than the smaller scales in the flow. And if you think about such swimmers, and we are interested in what happens at large distances from the swimmer's position. If you think about such swimmers, you can, uh, and they are moving at a constant velocity. Then uh, you can do a multiple expansion to look at the dynamic, the hydrodynamic interactions due to the swimmers, and the lowest order term which survives is a dipole. And a dipole can be oriented inward or outward, corresponding to a puller-like dynamics where the swimmer pulls from in front and a pusher-like dynamics which is commonly used in micro community, and uh, we are extending that to this intermediate Reynolds number. So having uh, set up the problem, let's take a look at how the, the order field looks like in such a system. So this video you're seeing here, uh, the 
Swimmers are located in this rectangular patch, and you can see how the odor field gets transported downstream. It's a horizontal cross-section, as this uh, illustration, you can see uh, that the, the shaded region corresponds to the, uh, the plane that you're seeing. So this is how the odor field looks like. And this particular video is without taking into account any hydrodynamic interactions introduced due to the presence or due to the dynamics of the swimmers. Now the question is, how does the odor transport differ once we introduce swimmers? So the first thing, the simplest thing one can look at is the mean odor field. And uh, let's, let's, let's see that, let's look at how the, how the picture changes how the picture changes between pusher and puller for mean order field. And instead of a horizontal cross-section, we look at the vertical cross-section because that contains the full picture. And what you're seeing is basically the mean or the average flow field in the vertical cross-section of the channel, uh, shown in this illustration, and the swimmers are placed over here. And there is nothing surprising here. The order field has, a highest, has the highest concentration close to the swimmers position, and it decays as you move farther away from the swimmers. And the boundary, the no slip boundary is along the bottom, along, along this axis. So in order to understand the effect of the swimmer's dynamics, what we can do is we can compute the same quantity for both pullers and pushers and compute the difference, which is what is shown over here. So what you're looking at is the difference in the mean order field along the vertical cross section Take, uh, between taking into account the polar dynamics and not taking into account the hydrodynamic interactions at all. And here, again, the swimmers are in this rectangular patch, and red region corresponds to area where, due to the hydrodynamic fluctuations introduced by the swimmers dynamics, the order field is amplified, and blue regions are where it is shielded. What you can see is that along the plane of the swimmers, the order field is shielded, whereas, whereas above and below the plane of the swimmers, it's amplified. So one, it has, it has some effect. If you look at the, if you look at the scale, uh, the effect is up to 20%. And second, looking at this picture, the, the first impression would be the effect of swimmers would be to redirect the order field so that it gets, um, it gets redirected along the above and below the plane of the swimmers, which is partially true, but not the entire story, as you will see uh, soon. But how does this picture change once we look at the other type, the pusher type swimmer? So this is a comparison between pusher and puller type swimmers. The top one is a pusher, and the bottom one is puller type swimmer. And what you can see is that qualitatively in the, along the downstream direction, it looks same, but for puller-like swimmers, there is a slight uh, they are slightly better at shielding their order along their uh, plane, they, along the plane of the placement of swimmers. And one can further quantify this by, by, uh, by calculating a shielding intensity as a function of the order sensitivity. Shielding intensity is effectively a normalized area shielded by the swimmers, and order sensitivity is a threshold which, uh, ab above which a predator would uh, identify the, the order. What you can see is that for large values of this order sensitivity, uh, the puller-like swimmers are better than pusher-like swimmers, and both of them shield the order up to even 30% of the entire detectable volume. Whereas as you reduce the sensitivity beyond a certain value, there is no more shielding, but the, uh, the actual area where the order field is detectable is more than the original area, the original unnormalized area. So what it tells us is that depending on the order sensitivity, swimming could potentially help the mean order and the order sensitivity parameter is something which would be associated with the predator. However, what is important, it's also important to note that the risk of predation is not the same across the entire volume it's more along the plane of the swimmer's position. And if you look at that, uh, the, the picture is slightly different. What you're seeing now is the, mean order, the difference in the mean order field along the plane of the swimmers. The left one corresponds to pusher-like swimmers and the right one is puller-like swimmers. And you can see that close to the position of the swimmers, for pushers, the, the order field is amplified, whereas for pullers, all throughout, it's shielded. And now if you compute the 
shielding in density as a function of order sensitivity. This is a plot that you get. And it's shielded all throughout, unlike the previous case in the entire volume. And polar like humors are always better than pushers. So far, we have talked about just the mean field. And as I told before, this is not the best quantity to evaluate the shielding intensity or the, the shielding efficiency of swimmers. Fluctuations are extremely important because that's what often um, leads to the detectability of the presence of swimmers. And one can look at fluctuations by directly computing the fluctuations or looking at the distribution of the order field for the entire domain. Or you can define a probability of detection by defining a threshold above which a predator might detect. We are looking at the third quantity. All of them would give similar results. So if you define a threshold, which would depend on the predator, above which a predator would detect the, uh, the, the order, that gives us an idea of the probability of detection. And by computing this for taking into account the hydrodynamic interactions and not taking into account hydrodynamic interactions, we can see whether the, uh, the swimming action has an effective shielding ability. And in order to do that, we had to define a threshold. And this is a quantity which should depend on the characteristics associated with the predator. A weak predator, which has a high threshold for detection, uh, let's, let's first look at that. The top one corresponds to the difference in the probability of detection for pusher-like swimmers. And the bottom one corresponds to puller-like swimmers. And red are regions where there is a higher probability of detection and blue are region where the probability of detection is lower. And what you can see, it's somewhat similar to the image that we saw before about the mean order. And close to the swimmer's position, there is a higher chance of detection, whereas everywhere else it is lower. However, this picture changes completely if we introduce a lower threshold for detection. Here, we use a very low threshold. And you can see that in the entire downstream direction along the position of the swimmers, the probability of detection has increased. Now, uh, one, from a biological perspective, this tells us that whether swimming helps to shield their order or not depends on the predator. But more importantly, this tells us that the hydrodynamic fluctuations, it, uh, the inter hydrodynamic interactions due to the swimming action uh, does not simply result in redirecting the order, but also fundamentally changes the order distribution. So that brings me to the end. To conclude, one, the swimming dynamics, even for these mesoscale swimmers, it does affect their order. Second, the ability to shield, it depends on the specific swimming mode. And third, what, which swimming mode is better? That question depends, the answer depends on the characteristics of the prey, the predator, and the environment. Thank you. So we have time for a few questions. Hi. Um, in the, in the um, slide that you showed about the uh, probability of detection with the positive and negative, what is like the bi biological idea of having a probability lower than zero for our detection? It's not the probability of detection. It is the, yeah, this plots. It's the difference between the probability of detection taking into account the swimmer's dynamics and not taking into account the swimmer's dynamics. So whether the swimmer's dynamics led to a higher probability of detection. So, yeah. Hello. Um, could you explain again what's the main difference between pusher swimmer and pulling swimmer in terms of swimming dynamics? And how did you uh, change the boundary condition in the DNS for that? So uh, first, in biologically, the, it comes down to if you, if you let a swimmer swim, uh, how does the far field, the far field of velocity field looks like? I mean, in a, uh, in a laminar flow. Uh, in, so that, that's an approximation. And in terms of how I implemented that, I used basically just a dipole. A dipole which is pointed outward is a pusher-like swimmer, and a dipole which is pointed inward is a puller-like swimmer. There's no change in the boundary condition of the flow field.
So at the scale of the sumers, the flow is, I mean, uh, if you look at the size of the sumers, that's more or less similar to the smaller scale, the Kolmogorov, Kolmogorov scale, but the order gets transported over a large distance, and if you look at that distance, it's certainly turbulent. So it's not about the scale of the sumers themselves, but uh, over the distance over which the order field gets transported. You could, so they, in a way, introduce local fluctuations, which one would assume has no role to play whatsoever over the long range distribution of the order, but it does. If, you, if you're asking whether it's sim it can be simply modeled by changing the boundary condition, I don't, I think it would be a little bit more complicated. I mean, to, I, one would have to assume uh, something, of, uh, something like an effective diff uh, diffusivity due to the presence of the humors. I mean, that would be one way to, like, build a model based on this. Okay, so hello everybody. Uh, thanks the organizer for setting up this very nice conference. And today I will talk about fungi. So fungi are um, not very uh, studied in biophysics, so uh, I hope to convince you that they are very exciting organisms. So they are quite important if you compare their weight in gigacarbon, gigaton of carbons on the biosphere, you see that they are more important than animals. They are making um, a symbiotic or parasitic uh, connection with almost all uh, multicellular uh, organisms, including us. And I will talk today about a particular uh, pathogen, fungal pathogen of humans, Candida albicans, with also a dimorphic yeast. So it has a yeast form. It can bud like Saccharomyces cerevisiae, or it can elongate uh, filaments, which are made of monu mononuclear uh, compartments. And both are involved in virulence, the yeast form for dissemination and the filamentous form for invasion and penetration. But it has been shown that only the presence of IFA can trigger uh, the death of the host. So it's quite important to study IFA. So this is what we are uh, doing in the team. And uh, we observe that when we put IFA into soft agar gels, they adopt an helical shape. And uh, so the main question we have uh, with my collaborators is, does helical growth affect virulence? And they are associated topics. The one is about the mechanism of this helical growth. Why do we have this helical growth? And for that, we would like to study uh, Candida albicans uh, IFA in 2D, because it's uh, easier to follow um, all scale what happened to the IFA, and, and, and for instance, the organelle of polarity, which is called the Spitzenkorper additive. And also the question we have is how the squelical growth can affect the IFA pathfinding in complex environments. So uh, let's start first to look at an IFA which is confined in 2D into microfluidic channels, which is uh, lower in height than the diameter of the IFA, and you see oscillations. But these oscillations, interestingly, are not built from a smooth curvature, uh, smooth movement, curve movement of the tip, but instead we, what we see are sliding events or instabilities in the distal part of the IFA that form the curvatures. Uh, so is it the first question, is it the signature of a squeezed ellipse? Um, so um, for that, uh, um, we think of a model where, as you see, one part of the IFA is solidified, doesn't move, and only a part close to the tip 
can undergo a massive rearrangement. So this is the work of my colleague Igor Kulik in Strasbourg, and uh, in a model where he, he considers a minimization of the allergy of a frustrated part close to the tip uh, that involves twist curvature and twist angles. What he has uh, seen is that we can reconstitute these instabilities of this growing IFA. So it seems that we have indeed a signature of this. Okay, last thing about past spending. Um, we uh, uh, put this IFA into uh, micro mazes in order to see how they behave when they encounter obstacles. So here, a, a, a IFA has three choices when at the corner of each obstacle, either going straight, left, or right. So uh, each uh, choice has a probability. Each IFA can be described by successive choices that the tip made, and we can establish transition probability matrix linking one event to the others. We can also deduce the uncorrelated matrix that only is, uh, comes from the transition uh, from the probabilities of each event, and the final probability that's really characterizing the IFA choices is the subtraction of the two matrix. So here, our first result that was obtained only one month ago with two uh, types of IFA, a wild type IFA, and a mutant of a phospholipase, which interestingly goes straight into agar gels. And when we put them in this uh, maze, typical maze of four micron in size of the, of the obstacle, uh, separated by four micron, we see that the IFA choose a staircase or going straight, but we see strong differences between the two uh, type of IFA. So more to come, of course, we are, we, uh, we are thinking about describing the IFA uh, better, not only with a Markovian uh, approach, but uh, looking also at the uh, many sequences, many type of sequences we, we, we observe. Okay, so I would like to thank the founders, uh, all the group working and my collaborators working on this project. And also I would like uh, to take advantage of this talk to advertise the poster because we work also on another topic in the group on biomechanics of circulating cancer cells and Arthur will present a poster tomorrow. Thank you for your attention. Okay, so we can do one long question or two short questions. <laughs> Good question, that's that the next step. In fact, we, we see that there is a sort of memory. For example, go, going right, left, right, left. So what happens if we put a tunnel, so make the IFA forget for a while, what will happen after? So this is the next step, after this regular maze to, to challenge them with real maze. Any other questions? Okay, so, uh, so this is another, the other part of the project. We have uh, uh, organ on a chip approach, gut on chip. And uh, we want to, to, to see if non helical versus helical uh, IFA have more uh, chance to, to penetrate and to get out of the tissue. So, yeah, ongoing. Okay. Let's, let's uh, thank us thank again. You. And, uh, our next speaker is uh, Ethan Wold.
Hello? Okay. Great. So um, <clears throat> my name's Ethan Wold. I'm a fourth year PhD student in Simon Sponberg's group at Georgia Tech. Um, and I'll be talking about uh, super resonant oscillations in insects. Um, so out of the four times that flight has evolved in animals, um, at least um, uh, insects, so insects basically are separated by the fact that they're millimeter to centimeter scale. Um, and one manifestation of their small size is the fact that they have to generate really fast, powerful wing beats in order to fly. So um, if we look at wing beat frequency across basically all insects, um, we see that there's a huge variation in wing beat frequency. So there are almost three orders of magnitude from this, the slowest to the fastest insects. Um, but also you'll notice that this is not a trait that's particularly well described by body size in that there's a ton of insects with roughly the same body mass but drastically different wing beat frequencies. So my favorite example of this is uh, bumblebee, bombus, um, and then the bee mimicking hawk moth, Hemeris definis, that has basically the same body size but a threefold smaller wing beat frequency. So a lot of what we're interested in is trying to understand this variation in wing beat frequency, uh, what's driving wing beat frequency diversity in insects, and why it might it not just be a simple function of body size. Um, so one of the hypotheses that's been around for a while in this regard is that insects are flapping at their resonant frequency. Um, and this is um, largely driven by the discovery of elasticity in the insect cuticle. So there's resolin and elastic protein inside the um, exoskeleton of this hawk moth that you can see um, the thorax deforming. And those deformations are driven internally by the flight musculature, which attaches to the outside of this, um, this sort of shell. Um, and because insect wings are inertial and they're in a fluid environment, this is you know, all the, the ingredients of a spring mass damper. So the thought has been that, um, that insects might be flapping at their resonant frequency to essentially locomote in the most efficient way possible. Um, so this is kind of the hypothesis of, of resonance tuning. It's been around for decades. Um, the idea is that insects have a resonance curve, so they have um, some frequencies that are preferential. Um, and operating at those frequencies explains wing beat frequency diversity broadly. Um, but the caveat is that they uh, don't have strong ability to modulate their wing beat frequency. So that's kind of this trade-off between efficiency and, uh, and frequency modulation in a resonance system. And in particular, if this was the case, if you measured a bunch of resonant frequencies of insects, you would see this nice linear trend with wing beat frequency with an intercept of zero. Um, so this has been something that's been around for a while in the literature, but quite difficult to actually test. So what we set out to do was in a model insect, and we're going to be using the hawk moth manduca sexta, parameterize what we call a spring wing model of a flapping insect to try and understand if it's at its resonant frequency or not. So this model is determined by, is parameterized by the muscle forcing here, um, an inertial component that's parameterized by the, the wing inertia, a simplified model of, of aerodynamics, which is essentially just a velocity squared um, aerodynamic force that is parameterized by wing shape and drag coefficient and, and things like that. And then the elastic component due to deformations of the thorax, and we can actually measure that by deforming um, insect thorax um, ex vivo. Um, so with this uh, model, we can then simulate a resonance curve and hopefully determine whether or not a hawk moth is likely flapping at its resonant frequency. Um, and what we find is that hawk moths are likely flapping significantly above their resonant frequency. So you can see the wing beat frequency is about 25 hertz, resonant frequency um, is, is about half that. And this is a finding that's, that's fairly robust to reasonable variation in any of the parameters that define this model. Um, so uh, what I did uh, later was then see if this was a general property of the cousins of Manduca sexta. So Manduca sexta is a bombacoid moth. Uh, it's a huge superfamily of moths, uh, hawk moths and silk moths. So we did this uh, same procedure in a bunch of different moth species and find that basically all of them are either at resonance or above resonance. So this property of being super resonant appears to at least generalize across this superfamily of moths that span um, about 60 hertz in wing beat frequency. So um, the next thing that we wanted to try and determine was whether or not super resonant wing beats, wing beats are potentially conferring some kind of frequency modulation advantage to these insects. And it turns out that in Manduca, if you perturb freely flying Manduca as it's feeding from a robotic flower with this vortex gun, um, they modulate their frequency to recover from these aerial perturbations by upwards of 30%. So we think that there is a frequency modulation benefit that's being conferred by operating above the resonant frequency. 
Um, so in summary of the first part, hawk moths appear to have substantial super resonant um, uh, behavior, which confers potential frequency modulation ability. And this is in stark contrast to um, flapping wing micro aerial vehicles or ro insect inspired robots, which are essentially built at resonance by necessity um, and suffer from pretty crippling control instabilities at the moment. So um, we're thinking about building um, some robots with our collaborators that are operating in the super resonant regime and hopefully being able to find a compromise between efficiency and um, control. Okay, so, um, so bringing us back to this plot of insect wing beat frequency, so far I've been talking about variation within this relatively low frequency regime over here, um, sub 100 hertz. Um, so now we wanna think about how faster flapping insects might be operating at or above resonance. Um, and it turns out that insects have evolved two totally different um, types of flight. So uh, two different types of flight muscles and actuation that actually kind of separate um, flyers above 100 hertz and below 100 hertz, roughly speaking. And you can see this on a phylogeny here. There are clades of insects that all correspond to fast flapping um, flight above 100 hertz that have developed what's called asynchronous flight muscle. So I'll explain what that means and how that works. So um, synchronous flight muscle is how slow flapping insects operate. And this is how um, your muscles work. Basically, your nervous system is specifying to the muscle when to, when to fire. So the frequency of the wing beat is being set by the frequency of some underlying neural drive to the flight muscle. In asynchronous insects, it turns out that doing this past a certain frequency of about 100 hertz becomes very difficult um, due to uh, active transport of, of calcium. It becomes very difficult to generate high power wing beats and cycle calcium at frequencies uh, above 100 hertz. So insects have evolved a totally different type of flight muscle, which decouples the wing beat frequency from the underlying neural drive. So bumblebees have totally emergent wing beat frequencies. And the thought has been that this is resonance. This has to be resonance. What other frequency could bumblebees be flapping at if not the resonant frequency of their flight system? Um, so how, how does this emergent uh, frequency come about? Well, you can think about uh, asynchronous flight muscle as having this characteristic stretch response. So if you take out an asynchronous flight muscle and you apply a step and strain, you'll see first a very fast viscoelastic response here. And then you'll see a delayed response that uh, has a characteristic time scale and force magnitude. And this is what actually drives the wing beat. And if you do these experiments in muscle, you'll find this characteristic phase three and phase four responses that we see here. And if you have two of these asynchronous muscles in an antagonistic relationship attached to an inertial load, when one of them contracts, the other one will be stretched, which will then after a short delay contract and then the system self excites. And that's in general how you get this um, decoupling of frequencies. Um, but we want to understand how these stretch activated muscles interact with the resonant mechanics of an insect um, and whether or not this necessarily means that asynchronous insects are flapping at resonance. Um, so we wanted to develop a model of, of this, this type of actuation and what we can do is fit a sum of two exponentials to this two rate process here. And then by going into the Laplace domain, um, we can sort of reverse engineer this second order equation for the dynamics of the asynchronous muscle force that's driven by a velocity feedback here. And then we can couple that to our first spring wing equation that's just the resonant mechanics of the flapping insect. And now we have a system of couple differential equations that when we solve for the dynamic variable phi of t gives us a wing beat trajectory, stroke angle as a function of time with an emergent frequency and amplitude. And we can study, for instance, the emergent frequency. Um, what makes this even more interesting is when I actually went and measured the stiffness of a bumblebee thorax and put it into our, our resonant mechanics model, we found that bumblebees also flap above their resonant frequency, um, robust to reasonable parameter variation. So you can see bumblebee wing beat frequency here and then the displacement and velocity resonance is here. So we wanted to understand whether this um, stretch activation incorporated into our resonant mechanics model can actually explain super resonant wing beats um, in asynchronous insects. So I'll take us back to this um, super resonant, sorry, this uh, resonant frequency on the x-axis and wing beat frequency on the y-axis here. And just to remind you, the wing beat frequency here is just, you know, the frequency of that emergent waveform. Uh, we have our resonant frequency here and we have a third axis I'm gonna add, which is the, um, the rate of force rise, that delayed uh, force rise exponential rate. So you can think of pink being a very fast intrinsic muscle rate and blue being a very slow intrinsic muscle rate. And here's the equivalency line of, of resonance. So if a bumblebee is here, that means it's flapping at its resonant frequency. 
And we find that for um, low muscle rates, um, insects would flap very close to their resonant frequency. But as you crank up that intrinsic muscle rate, the emergent oscillation frequency becomes super resonant. And in fact, it can go arbitrarily super resonant if you just keep making this, this intrinsic muscle rate um, faster. So um, basically, uh, we found that asynchronous insects um, in the context of this model can be super resonant. And in fact, there's a very large region of parameter space where they might be super resonant. Um, and um, the other thing that this, this does is it suggests a couple of um, uh, a couple of ways that you could evolve different wing beat frequencies if you're an asynchronous insect that are more or less orthogonal. So you can modify the muscle rate, which is a physiological property of the muscle, or you could modulate your mechanics, say the inertia or the stiffness of your system, in order to evolve a new wing beat frequency if you're an asynchronous insect. So uh, this is approximately where we think bumblebees lie in this sort of fairly weakly super resonant regime. And this allows us to explain some interesting observations in, um, in nature. So one thing that struck me when I started my PhD was that, um, that the Drosophila, the fruit fly that everybody studies, is so much smaller than a bumblebee, but it flaps at almost the same frequency. So you can see the body mass is like three orders of magnitude different, um, but their wing beat frequencies are very close to one another. And we can actually explain this with our model of um, asynchronous resonance. So if you put that muscle time scale on the y-axis and the, the natural period on the x-axis, you can see that bumblebees and flies actually achieve a relatively similar region of emergent frequency in this parameter space, but do that with different combinations of muscle and mechanical uh, rates and time scales. Um, so we think that super resonance is actually a fairly general property of insect flight that has not been appreciated until very recently. Um, and just to summarize, so in the first part, I talked about our work on synchronous insects, demonstrating that uh, hawk moths and their cousins are likely super resonant, and this might confer frequency modulation capacity um, to recover in aerial perturbation scenarios. And then also asynchronous insects, which have evolved a totally different specialized flight muscle type to flap very quickly, might also be asynchronous. And this actually emerges from interactions between two time scales, a purely mechanical one and a muscle physiological one. So uh, with that, I'd just like to thank my collaborators at UCSD, Nick Gravish, and my advisor, Simon Sponberg, um, and funding sources, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Yes. Yeah, so people have done, not quite that experiment, but I mean, people have done wing clipping experiments. Those are, the, those are the classic experiments in asynchronous insects where they essentially are artificially changing the resonant frequency. And you, you do see super resonance, uh, you see a signature of super resonance in those scenarios in that um, resonance and wing beat frequencies as you clip the wings are linearly related, but they don't have a zero intercept. So there's some, um, potential super resonant like evidence from there. Um, I don't know if people have done any like neural inhibitors in asynchronous insect. Um, you might not be able to get away with that because even though asynchronous muscle is primarily activated by stretch, it still needs a tonic level of calcium and the underlying neural drive serves to just keep calcium at, at a constant kind of level. So if you totally get rid of all calcium transport in the muscle, the muscle's just not gonna activate at all. But it's definitely an interesting idea. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great point. It's a simplified uh, aerodynamic model that we're using here, but we have a student in the lab who is um, using our wind tunnel to essentially test that very question about what happens when you have a stretch activated system with complex fluid flow. And preliminary evidence would suggest that uh, at least for kind of like normal realistic flight conditions an insect would experience, it probably doesn't matter that much but uh, potentially in like very perturb per per perturbative or turbulent conditions, it might matter quite a bit, so, yeah. I have a question. So it seems like uh, 
wrong, but uh, the smaller the wing, the faster they flap. Is there an inverse relation size and, and frequency? Yeah, it's generally the case, but um, it's not so straightforward because the fruit fly has f a wing size that's four orders of magnitude smaller than the bumblebee, but they flap at the same frequency. Yes, but, but I mean wing size compared, compared to body size. Oh, oh, the relative size of wing and body size. Yeah, I'm not so sure if people have made that plot exactly, but I would imagine that, um, I would imagine so, that as you get smaller. It appears like yeah. they need to flap faster to create more uh, lift. Yeah, so, so there's definitely a general, if you, um, if you look at that first plot that I showed of wing beat frequency and body size, there's definitely a downward trajectory. So it's definitely the case that generally as you get smaller, um, you need to flap faster, but there's just a ton of spread around that, which is basically the, um, the question that we're trying to get at. Yeah. So our, our next speaker is uh, Jacobo Marchi. Um. Okay, um, all right. Okay, so today um, I'll, I'll show you how uh, bacteriophage can copropagate co-propagate uh, with the rapidly expanding population of bacteria through uh, transport of infections. Um, so our collaborators uh, at University of Exeter, um, Remy Chait and Tiga Kalek, um, put uh, some bacteria on the blue dot there in a pretty big petri dish in soft agar and then they inoculated the, uh, in the red dot some phage, which are essentially viruses that can infect and kill uh, bacteria. So when, when bacteria will, will start uh, growing, they will consume resources uh, and attractants, such as uh, serine and aspartate. And uh, as they, they consume these, these chemicals, they will generate a gradient, uh, which then they will uh, track and they will uh, produce a chemotactic range expansion um, uh, at a constant uh, speed. And when they meet the viruses, um, we start observing a lysis and, and death of uh, bacterial cells. And, uh, and you see that the infection gets uh, uh, transported for very long uh, scales compared to the size of these microbes. Um, and uh, note that uh, the range expansion by chemotaxis is uh, much faster than uh, uh, inanimate phage would be uh, able to diffuse uh, through space, even accounting for the Fisher wave uh, produced by their, their um, proliferation. Um, importantly, um, our collaborators tried several different pairs of phage and bacteria. For instance, uh, they uh, inoculated T4 before it was T7, another phage. And we keep observing the stability of this transport of, of the infections. And uh, even for other types of bacteria, such as uh, notably um, a clinically relevant, clinically relevant uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa uh, strain. Um, so this, this stability of the transport of this infection is remarkably sta uh, robust to um, the different choices in uh, uh, Escherichia coli and phage types. Um, to investigate what are the key drivers of this phenomenon, we, we studied a uh, partial differential equation model where bacteria um, can uh, 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 consume resources and grow. Uh, then we add an attractant that the uh, bacteria will consume and they will generate uh, a gradient through, a, and then they will chemotact through a re response curve that was characterized and, and exploited in several previous works. And then we add uh, viruses that infect cells, uh, which notably can uh, chemotact, and then they kill them and produce copies of themselves. Um, this model with this few uh, infection and uh, um, uh, chemotaxis uh, features reproduces 
importantly, the stability of the infection transport and some uh, qualitative uh, features of these uh, experimental patterns, and then varying the um, uh, phage life traits, we actually can reproduce uh, some, other, uh, some other pattern, at least qualitatively, uh, that we see, for instance, for phage T4 and even for lysogenic phage uh, P1-Vir. Um, and uh, finally, we ask whether this would be possible without chemotaxis for the infected cells. Um, and uh, as you may imagine, um, these, first of all, it's not possible. So they, they, if the infected cells stop sensing the attractant, you lose uh, the uh, infection transport right away. And even for intermediate values, that, that wouldn't uh, be sustained. Whereas uh, essentially for T7 parameters, uh, if, the, if uh, infected cells can uh, detect the attractant at 80% um, efficiency, uh, the bacteria carry the viruses uh, happily with themselves. Um, so uh, to close, uh, essentially we, we found this, this table tra infection transport. Um, infection stability is robust to choices in, in phage and bacteria, and our uh, partial differential equation model reproduces the, the transport and some uh, features of the experiments, and you need infected cells to swim and chemotact to, to be able to reproduce it. Uh, with this, I'd like to thank Remy Chait and Tiga Kalek at the University of Exeter, uh, my postdoc mentor Joshua Weitz at University of Maryland, and uh, Abir, who was a master's student with us a couple of years ago. Uh, and yeah, that's all. Questions? No, we actually, that's a great question. Uh, we didn't explore the ly lysogenic and uh, uh, non-lytic part of the, the phage uh, life cycles very deeply so far. So um, we mostly focus on lytic phage and we effectively recapitulate some patterns of um, um, some lysogenic phage such as P1-Vir due to the phenomenological nature of this model. But that's, that's definitely something we want to look into. Thank you. Yeah. Well, nothing moves. I mean, they are just diffuse, uh, and they, they, it, it's not true that they don't, they don't move. But they, it will diffuse through fischer kolmogorov wave, which is much slower. Um, and uh, okay, that's a good question. I don't know. I didn't try to switch it off. That's. I guess I should. Um, Okay, yeah, thanks. Um, I, I think uh, probably phage would win, meaning you would, you would uh, reach a situation in which uh, you, you basically phage will start lies around. Uh, in fact, what they did, they did something a bit different. The, our collaborators uh, essentially increased the agar concentration a lot. It's not, ex it's not really the same thing because you also are um, kind of reducing bacterial the diffusive part of the run and tumble motion in, in this uh, uh, phenomenological description, but uh, essentially uh, they saw that uh, their phage win. But uh, we should try more, more quantitatively what you suggested. Okay, let's thank Jacobo again. Ah, um, okay, one question. Sorry, what, I missed the last couple of words. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we tried it. Uh, we actually uh, tried to include the fact that uh, resources and attractant can be released upon lysis, which is not exactly what you're saying, but it's similar in a way. We didn't see a big uh, difference. Uh, let's uh, thank Jacobo again.
speaker is uh, Benjamin Garcia de Figueredo. Figure this out here. We're not playing. Okay. Uh, now this. It should work. Has worked. Excellent. Um, Hi everyone, my name is Benjamin Figueiredo. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about a project that I have just started. I'm, uh, I'm in the tail end of my first year of my PhD. So um, I'm going to be talking today about Myxococcus xanthus. Myxococcus xanthus is a rod-shaped bacteria that glides around on surfaces. And um, it's in, in particular, when I say rod-shaped, you have to think that this is a, a tail-to-head symmetric organism. And like many bacteria, it forms colonies. Now, if you have a dense colony of things that are rod-shaped, if you pack a bunch of rods together, they have to choose a direction. Now, when you pick a direction, uh, and you don't pick this direction in coordination with your neighbors, you're going to form uh, an orientation field which can have discontinuities. And these continuities are uh, determined by uh, the, the symmetry group that you have broken and the symmetry group you have remaining. Now, because they are tail to head symmetric, this, uh, you have broken the rotation group into a reflection group, so you can have uh, these topological defects that are associated with uh, 180 degree rotation. Uh, right, so these are winding numbers essentially, and, and this uh, gives you a topological charge in your flow that is conserved. Uh, now, the, I'm showing here the two most important kinds of defects, the ones that have charge plus one half and minus one half. And the important thing to notice here is that the plus one half charge defects have this property of having uh, the flow sort of colliding into one another. So you have something that builds up stress at a point, and that's what you're seeing on the, on the defect on the left-hand side there. The, the, the cells are running into one another. And this is important biologically because Myxococcus xanthus, when it is starving, it forms these fruiting bodies, these very interesting three-dimensional structures where they aggregate together and they sporulate together to form this multicellular body. Now, another thing that you can see is that if there are places where there is higher density, you're also seeing places that have lower density. And these places that have lower density um, are becoming holes. Now, I'm using these data that is uh, collected by Katie Copenhagen, where I have these bacterial monolayers that have holes Right? And I'm going to analyze what these holes are doing, what their dynamics are, and so on. Uh, so I trained a, a neural network to, to find these holes. It does a decent job. You can see the bacteria moving around, and the holes are sort of being holes, right? They, they, and they're moving, having interesting shapes. Now, these holes are located in a pneumatic fluid that has topological defects. So it can capture charge, and this is something that we are observing in this movie here. So the holes that are colored in this movie are holes that have charge in them. So you see that this magenta colored thing is a, is a plus one half charged hole. And this plus one half charged hole has a, an interesting shape that is associated with the topological charge that it has, but we also see that it lives a lot longer than the other holes that are popping in and out of existence all the time. So topological charge, plays a, a role not just in, in the formation of these holes, but also in their stability is what we are guessing. And I'm in the start of this project, but I, I have a, a bunch of ideas that I'd be happy to discuss offline. Uh, and with that, I, I'll finish my presentation and thank my lab. Questions? Yes? Yeah, uh, for holes. So re regardless of whether you're talking about holes or, or point defects, what you do is that you, you, capture, you, you calculate somehow the, the orientation field of your, of your flow, and then you do a, a circulation integral around it. Yeah, exactly. It's just a circulation around the hole. Any other questions? Okay. So um, our next and final speaker is uh, Aradia Janala. Yes, thank you.
Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Aradia Rajanala. I'm a fourth year quantitative biosciences major at Georgia Tech under Professor Daniel Goldman. Um, and I'm here to talk about plant, uh, plant root circumentation and a simulation I've built to investigate it. So, um, usually when we think about um, navigation through anything, and especially, and including underground, we tend to think about animals moving. Um, but plants also have to solve this problem. We have um, Plant roots in particular have to go through a wide variety of terrain to be able to anchor and find resources. Um, and in this sense, they act as navigators. Um, however, unlike animals, they don't have central nervous systems. So any strategy they use end up having to use, um, any strategy they use have to um, use local or chemical stimuli. They can't use um, something like a brain to coordinate their cells. Um, so, in the Goldman Lab, one way which we use to um, investigate strategies to go through complex environments is to look at um, these organisms in relatively simple environments. Um, and that can let us isolate exactly what the, um, in this case, plant roots are doing. So, this is an example of some plants, of a plant root moving through a lattice. Um, we can also, um, and here we're growing them in gel um, made of some plant root nutrients and some gel xan, which is a gelling agent and looking at them going through stiff, um, colliding into a layer of stiff and soft gel, and you can see that it ends up moving on the surface instead of penetrating through. And um, looking at a plant root as, it, as we move it in gravity. This is an example container, um, but you can see if, as we tilt the container, it'll change the direction of gravity for the plant root. Um, so I wanna focus in on a couple of strategies which plants use. Um, first, thing about tropisms. This is um, exactly that same box with the plant in it, um, over long periods of time. And you can see this plumb, the plumb bulb up top tells you what direction gravity is in, and you can see the plant roughly following that gravitational direction. Um, this is an example of tropism, gravitropism, and it's the plant's, uh, plant roots response either towards or away from some stimulus. Um, I want to contrast this with the behavior which I've been interested in studying, circumutation. Um, breathing up. Okay, can I switch my laptop? It seems like this is gone. Are we good? Maybe. No. Did either deciding to play and not play? Well, okay. Give me thirty. Give me two seconds. Let me. now? Huzzah. Thanks for, thanks for the patience. So um, as I was saying, I wanted to contrast this with circumutation, which is the plant's, um, this helical motion at the root tip. And um, with this, there isn't a direct stimulus for sure that it's following. There's no, um, no magical thing which is going along helically. And this has been the um, feature which I've wanted to study recently. So um, just to give a little bit more 
um, another look at this, it's again this helical motion. And if we zoom out, you can see that this is a transient behavior. Um, once you move past this region of growth, you don't see a helix over the whole root. Instead, it ends up leveling itself out as it grows. Um, we study Osatiba rice roots. Um, these are, rice roots are very important agriculturally, and we also have the genome map. So this is another, um, alongside Arabidopsis, is one of the most popular plants um, studied. Um, but we found that this behavior is very important in penetration and exploration. Um, we've actually created a robot which does, in this case, not circummutation because it's a 2D robot, but mutation um, with an averting tip. And you can see that uh, if you mutate, you're able to get past many obstacles that a uh, non-mutating robot would not get past. Um, you can see the one which doesn't mutate gets stuck very quickly. So we have this behavior, and we can see that it is um, beneficial when exploring terrain. Um, but I'd like to point out that unlike this robot here, plants are made out of cells. Um, and this will, um, and these cells are what has to regulate any behaviors which we see. So a little bit of plant biology. Um, the way we can think about plant, at the bottom is the root cap. This is a stationary, this is a basically static piece for our intents and purposes. Above this is the meristematic zones where cells divide, and above this is the elongation zone where cells elongate into place. Um, we can compare this to a real root. This is a confocal image taken at the Benfi lab. And if we zoom in on a couple of these spots, we can see that above the cells are more elongated, while below the cells are more, are much shorter. So we can identify where the elongation and meristematic zones are in the root. So the idea here is that segmentation has to be um, regulated by the cell growth. Um, and the way they do this, we believe, is by elongating, elongating their cells at different rates. When we take pictures of a, bend, of a root which is bending in circumstation, we can see that the inner bend it has cells that are smaller than the outer bend. Um, recently, up till now, we've kind of thought of circumstation as an on or off behavior. Um, either a, a plant is circumstating or it doesn't. But recently, we've seen that um, depending on their environment, plants can uh, change their circumstation without necessarily turning it all the way off. So um, on the left here is a plant grown is less stiff in less stiff gel versus on the right, more stiff gel. And the percentage of gels then roughly tells you the stiffness of the gel. And we can see that the um, mutation patterns are very different. You see much bigger mutation than the um, less stiff versus the stiffer gel. Um, and indeed, we can use this to see a whole spectrum of different behaviors. Um, so going from left to right, we have least stiff to most stiff. And then on the very right side, we have a chemically inhibited, a root which has chemically inhibited circumstation. So this one will barely mutate at all. And we can think of this as kind of an ex extreme. So as we go from left to right, we can kind of see this circumstation being suppressed. Um, one of the questions I had is how do we quantify this so that we can analyze it a little further. So what we've done is we take our root and we ta crack the tip, and then we can uh, look at just the X displacement over time. And this is where we can very clearly see our uh, mutating bands. And this we can characterize through signal analysis, or uh, spectral analysis, uh, very similar to how you would look at signals. Um, this is an example of a path of a root. And this is the respective uh, spectrogram. This looks at the frequencies over time um, of what's going on. So in this, we see a very clear low, pa uh, low band frequency, which is the overall trajectory of the root, and then a higher one, which tells you what the oscillations are. And you can see with very clear oscillations, you get very um, bright colors. And then as we increase the stiffness of the gel which the roots are growing in, you can see that the, this upper band gets suppressed and it seems to move in space, and it seems to move higher, so you see higher frequencies. Um, so to look at this further, we can look, use a high-pass filter to cut out that lower band, and then look at the maximums of the frequency where it happens and what it is, and use that to get a rough idea of what amplitudes and periods these roots follow. When we do that, we can roughly see that we have a correlation between the period and amplitude of the um, root, and the different stiffnesses of gels lead to different um, landing in different spots in this correlation, on this line. Um, you can see there's roughly two lines here. This line is what we believe is the circumstation. And this line, um, you can see these patterns. And I would argue that these are um, points where the circumstation is indistinguishable from the random movements of the root. Roots are, bio, uh, roots, roots are biological, so cells will grow at different sizes. And that will cause things to move around slightly. And that means that over here, you'll see one circumstation is inhibited enough, you'll stop being able to distinguish it from just random movements. 
So my big question is, how can we use this to coordinate, or how does uh, cell level behaviors coordinate these tons of different types of um, circumstation? So um, again, to reiterate, um, cell, uh, the plant, root, plant is made of cells, and we want to figure out how those cells can affect the overall root. And it turns out there aren't a lot of simulations which have looked at both the cell level behaviors and the overall organ level behavior at the same time. So I've set out to make one. And basically, it's exactly as I said. We're trying to look at if we model each cell of the plant as some particle in our simulation, can we get a general idea of what segmentation is? Um, to do this, I'm using LAMPS. Um, it's a molecular dynamic simulator. Um, used a lot for um, chemical, um, a lot of different chemical analysis. I'm using some of its properties to be able to build that root. So I've created a, 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 scale a cell scale model of the epidermal layer of the root, which is the outer layer, outermost layer. Um, you can see that each cell here roughly represents a particle here, and we've scaled the model accordingly. Um, again, we're looking at the, um, just the outer layer of the root. So to um, uh, create an analog for the inner model, we just uh, put bonds in between to roughly preserve the diameter of the root. Um, we believe that circumstation is regulated by this outer layer. So to model the interactions between cells in, in the root, you can think about Again, each cell is a, is a little dot here on this lattice. And any interaction that happens have to be neighbor to neighbor. Um, either cells sliding past each other or cells that are stacked on top of each other so they'll push each other along. And to model this, I've done exactly the same. We have um, bonds in between the cells going um, across files and up and down. Yes? OK. Um, and what that leads to, and um, this lets us model what's going on in the root. This does have some um, limitations. For example, you can't model it if uh, cell files slide too far past each other, but that ends up just fine. It turns out in the root, um, once a, once a uh, cell divides into place, it's not allowed to move um, relative to its neighbors. So every cell will always have the same neighbors, just like our model. So it's pretty easy to create um, straight growth. All you do is grow the, root, grow the rows in order, um, but how much do you create segmentation? So you have to have one side of the root growing faster than the other side. That's the crux of everything. That'll create a bend, and then we have to send this bend all the way around the root. So you can imagine, let's say that the orange here is the fastest growing cell, and the green here is the slowest growing cell, um, and that we delay, we delay the cell's growth. We can imagine that we can draw a line here, and then rotate that line around as the root grows. And that'll allow us to create segmentation. This creates pretty uh, two relatively obvious parameters. How much do cells delay, and how quickly do we shift this axis segmentation? Um, so um, this model, just to show, it does, in fact, create uh, some kind of segmentation. You can see at some point, we have longer cells and shorter cells, and that's what's creating the bend in the overall picture. But as the root continues to grow, this bend eventually equalizes, which is why we don't see a, a bend which is like a helical pattern in the actual root tip. So thinking back to those parameters earlier, how, I, how might we recreate our different phenotypes of segmentation? Well, I started with the rotation speed um, as one parameter, and you can see it actually does affect both the amplitude and the period of segmentation. The faster you, the faster you send the segmentation around, of course, the faster you'll end up um, getting the net result of this behavior. But um, you'll also decrease the amplitude because, less, because fewer cells are bending in the same direction. And if we stack um, this simulation on top of the model, which I've, or on top of our data from previously, you can see that it roughly matches in the regimes where we have data for segmentation. Above a certain point, the plant doesn't actually reach these amplitudes, but we can model them in our, um, with our uh, simulation. But in, again, in the regimes which we're looking at segmentation, or we can see segmentation in our experiment, um, our simulation roughly matches. So um, just a quick summary. We can, um, plants can modulate the amplitude and period of the circumstation depending on their environment. Um, likely, our guess is that this is to try to get to a place where they can anchor. Um, if cells are less, if the um, environment is less stiff, then they'll end up thinking that they're not anchoring properly, versus if it's stiffer, they will inhibit the circumstation to grow down faster. Um, so we've built a cell model which is able to create segmentation, and we've um, identified a potential um, parameter that cells can modulate in order to um, 
match with their experiments. Um, thank you so much. Awesome. I yes. Uh, awesome question. So the, um, in the experiment, the roots are about 50-50 in terms of the handedness. They're not consistent in one direction. Once they start circumutating, they tend to stay in that direction. We, in very rare cases, do see the reversals. Um, but they are, they are pretty rare, so we don't have as much data on them, but we have seen them in the past. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. And there is, um, in especially the less of gels, there are, the, there are a whole bunch of parameters that can affect the um, amplitude and frequency of the off circumentation. We've seen, again, I've used gel stiffness to roughly get at a bunch of different phenotypes here. Um, we've seen that light affects it, heat can affect it. Um, the point, I guess, which I'm trying to make is that with this wide variety of different types of um, circumutation, can we create a model that's able to capture those so we can get an idea of what exactly is being modulated inside the plant root that will allow us, that will allow all of these. Say that again? No, not, not currently. It's a great. It's a great question. We don't 100% know about what all of those um, what those benefits might be. Um, if you get stochasticity, and we um, we see a lot in the less or in the stiffer gels or where circumentation is suppressed, we see a lot um, more irregular patterns. But that tends to lead to much smaller displacements of the root tip as well. So that um, we see that that tends to mean less exploration. So we believe, so my best guess is that the periodicity helps it um, maximize the amplitude of the um, perturbations, which lets you explore more area. Yes. Um, not yet. We haven't tested. We've tested it in Gelzan, which is our which is our viscoelastic homogeneous medium where we can see through, and we've tested it in um, basically growing in growing in water or air with these um, posts, which you've, which I saw showed at the beginning. Um, we haven't tested it in uh, wet soils yet, and I haven't. Um, we haven't looked at that, so that's definitely an interesting place to look. I know. One thing is visualization becomes very difficult once you start moving to soil, so it'll very likely require something else, something other than just optical tracking. Yes? Yeah, a hundred percent. I um, we do see if you start to put in heterogeneities where suddenly you you know let a plant grow for a certain amount of time and then you are in darkness, for example, and then you let it collide into something, you will see the circumstation start to pop up. And again, the question is, how do you switch that? Right? How do you go from less circumstation to more circumstation in the plant from a cell level? Um, I'm not necessarily trying to get at the like how the plant is modulating. Or oh, right rather what circumstances the plant is modulating or not modulating the circumentation, because there's a ton of different parameters that can affect this. But rather what exactly is changing as you, you know, change from these circumentations. And this parameter of how quickly you're sending the signal around might be the um, indicator as to how fast you're, or how 
strong as their temptation is at that moment. Okay, so let's uh, thank Karadi again.